Hi, I'm Sharon Jessup, an entrepreneur, adventurer, conservationist, storyteller, mom and wife from South Africa. On the show today, we will be collapsing the myths about South Africa and the African people being so dangerous. I'll share stories about walking with an elderly gent, any Sunday best, uphill, and a young man running with me for 10 kilometers in his Crocs and being completely safe while being the only white person and a female at that for miles. We'll also talk about why I'm so committed to rhino conservation and the complexities around rhinos that include the rangers, the poachers, and all the other animals related to the life of a rhino. And we will finish up with why when it comes to the big things in life, motivation won't get you there, but we are going to tell you what will. Congratulations, you are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, he's an executive mentor to leaders like you. Dolph Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dolph Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of Leadership Excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Dove Baron Leadership and Loyalty Podcast. I'm your host, Dove Baron. I'm here to assist you tapping into the one thing in your business that changes everything by transforming meaning into action. On that subject, special announcement, my brand new course has just recently been released. It's on CourseifyX.com. It's titled Creating a Culture of Belonging. This course is is separated out into eight sections. It's going to take you by the hand and walk you through exactly what you need in order to create a culture of belonging. Because creating a culture of belonging maximizes your personal and corporate success. Get ready to strap yourself in and put on the tank so you can dive deep into creating a culture of belonging for your organization. Curious to know more? Simply go to CourseifyX.com forward slash belonging that's c-o-u-r-s-i-f-y-x dot com forward slash belonging all right on to today's show (laughs) life without meaning is a life without substance you've heard me say that many times unveiling the path to meaning is often found in the power of causes but have you ever wondered what ignites our inner fire that leads us to find our ultimate purpose. It's a question that has captivated audiences worldwide, and the secret, my friend, is in causes. It infuses our lives with meaning. We must discover something worth fighting for, something that is beyond our comfort. But here's the million-dollar question. How do we unearth our causes? More importantly, how do we persevere when the going gets imaginably tough? Well, brace yourself. The answers will be revealed on the coming episodes of the Leadership and Loyalty podcast with our guest from South Africa, Sharon Jessup. But before we dive in, as always, we need your help in staying relevant. So please get over to wherever you tune into the podcast and do us a favor, rate, review, and subscribe to the show. It makes a huge difference, and we really need your help to do that. If you are a regular listener, big thank you to you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners, and we are honored and grateful to be cited by Inc.com as the number one podcast to make you a better leader. All right, before we dive in, let me ask you a question. Who's controlling the meaning of your life? Now, the obvious answer is you, but is that true? Discovering our true purpose is a burning question that everybody who's ever sort of dug into themselves has, has fought with. To infuse our lives with meaning, we've got to find a cause worth fighting for. You heard me say that earlier. Because without that, kind of life loses its juice. And it's precisely why I boldly declare that comfort is the enemy of innovation. So let me ask you, what is the cause that you are willing to rebel for? It's a question that our guest for the next two episodes, Sharon Jessup, understands probably a bit better than most. Sharon is a wildlife warrior a conservationist, an ultra-endurance athlete, adventurer, entrepreneur, keynote speaker, and storyteller 
from South Africa. She has completed four running expeditions to date. She has run through 28 of the big five game reserves to promote rhino conservation. She's also run through some of the most remote areas of South Africa, through some of the biggest townships in South Africa, and has had amazing conversations with the people from all walks of life while she's been on foot. She is passionate about telling these stories and dispelling the myths about South Africa as being a truly dangerous place. Sherry Jessup is a wife, a mother, an adventurer, an entrepreneur, a keynote speaker, storyteller, uh, obsessed with the beautiful places and spaces and the gorgeous people of South Africa. She is a serial entrepreneur involved in various enterprises, including having a professional business consultancy business, assisting and supporting nonprofit organizations that she works with. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and help me to welcome recovering lawyer, living conservationist, and rebel with a cause, Sharon Jessup. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So lovely to be here and to join you. Yeah, it took us uh, almost six months, but we got it. We're, we're here. I'm glad to have you here. Thank you so much for being with us. You know, I remember our first conversation. It was really fascinating. You've definitely been on quite the journey, and we're going to get into that. But all journeys are fueled. And one of the questions I like to start the show with, because I think that oftentimes people get caught up in getting to goals and outcomes, and they forget what's fueling that. So let me ask you, what is the origin story of what gives your life meaning? Okay, so for me, and this is actually a question that I myself have pondered upon ad nauseum, to be honest. And the bottom line for me is that you have to be of use. You have to be of service to a cause greater than yourself because you cannot keep fueling the passion, the purpose, if it's only for you. So you have to make it about something bigger than just me, myself, and I. So I always aim to be that person that bring the sunshine, that highlight the cause, and to be of use to mankind, to Mother Earth, and all her creatures and critters. But what is the, what's the origin story of that for you? Where did that start for you? I get that that's how you're living, but where did it start? It started many years ago at Ford Motor Company, right here in Port Elizabeth. And um, I was very, and I still am, very goal-driven, but there's been a shift. So what, what really was the pinnacle point for me to change was when I was called in by my then manager. And, you know, as managers do, they say, sit down, which I did, took out my, <laughs> my notebook and my pen, and I got ready to do some you know, take some notes. And he said to me, put that away. I want to talk to you on a personal level. And he actually said to me that when you are in a good space, you know, people will follow you everywhere and anywhere. But when you're in a bad space, people run from you. They fear you. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be feared. You know, I'm a happy Oh, I thought I was a happy-go-lucky person and I thought I was that person that brought the sunshine and that brought all the good stuff, the motivation, the inspiration. And I could talk people literally into going through valleys and climbing mountains. But then I heard this, you know, he just dropped this bombshell on me and I thought, no, 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 something has to change. And it was really at that point where I started my personal journey to become a better person. You can do good, but the intentions behind it might not be the right intentions. And that, that to me was just, oh, that just changed my entire life. The, and the entire tra trajectory of my life. Because I started working on my then anger issues and realized, and this is a hard thing to do, realized that I had allowed myself to become a victim of my circumstances as opposed to being victorious and changing it around. 
And I loved what you said right in the beginning of the show, Dov, where you said you are responsible for your life. You are responsible for everything that happens in your life, whether it's good or bad, okay? And that, to me, was my turning point. That was my pinnacle point where things started changing for me. So was there a point, you know, every human being has an ego, and we, we maybe like to not think that we do have one, but of course we do. And that ego likes things to be the same and likes to justify, to use my uh, very eloquent uh, language, we like to justify our own bullshit. So, um, or rhino shit, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, <laughs> so, which is, I imagine, quite large. Did you feel any resistance to that feedback about, you know, because you said you like to think that you were the bringing the sunshine and the, uh, and and you could drive and motivate people, and to hear this side of you that yeah, you can also scare the crap out of people, and they want to run away from you. What was the resistance to that, or was there a resistance to that? And how did you overcome that resistance? Oh, absolutely. At for, at first, I was literally floored. I thought yeah. <laughs> this 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 man must be smoking something. He must be on something because this yeah. is not the person that I am in my mind, you know? So so first there's this shock, this horror, and then it starts sort of working on your subconscious mind and you think, let me just start analyzing my behavior, my reaction to people, how I interact with them, how I speak to them. And it, it's about more than just your work life, it's also how you conduct your personal relationships or friendships, you know? Yeah how you deal with your family members. And it took me quite a while to get to that point of acceptance. Where, okay, I am actually sometimes this this thunderstorm, this this walking hurricane that, are dis- that, that can be destructive as opposed to being uplifting, which I thought I was in my mind. Sure. But the way I went about it was completely wrong, you know. And we, yeah, um, I used to start, yeah. absolutely, absolutely, yeah. yes. And you had... Children? Right. Yes, one son, and he was in junior school at the time, so he was still a youngster then. So were they recognizing this hurricane as well? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely. I want, see, here's what I wonder. Had they, had they told you you were a hurricane before this manager? Uh, my husband a number of times, but yeah. obviously, you know, you cannot possibly believe your spouse. I mean, how can they possibly be right? <laughs> There's an old saying, a wise man is a fool in his own village. And, a, and Absolutely. It, so you spend that in dove language and a freaking idiot in his own home. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, absolutely. I have no idea what you're talking about until my manager tells me, and now, okay, it's possible. <laughs> absolutely, indeed, you know. And, um, I mean, even my sister have commented a long time ago that sometimes, you know, I, I kind of talk to people like they are idiots and... That also was quite a blow, you know, it's like literally yep. getting a punch in the stomach and and going, no, but I'm not that person, you know, person that, that person you're describing, that's not me, you know, I don't feel like that person on the inside. But obviously, I needed to do work on my delivery and the intentions and also, you know, the energy that you put out. Towards people, towards things, and the energy that you put into this. So all of that needed to be tweaked quite a bit. Sure. Now, I talked about at the beginning that you've run through 28 of the big five game reserves to promote rhino conservation. So the first question obviously has to be, why rhino? And what is it about rhinos versus lions or any of the other big five as an example? Okay, I get that question quite often, as you can imagine. So, rhinos is what we call a keystone species, along with your apex predators like your lions, wolves, buffalo, African elephants, etc. So, basically, your keystone species is a species that holds an entire ecosystem together. And if you remove that species from that ecosystem, you literally have a breakdown in the entire web of life. So that ecosystem is changed 
drastically, normally not for the better, right. permanently. So permanent damage takes place. So, you know, we think of a rhino going extinct. It's just an animal. It's one species. No, it's actually that entire ecosystem that is affected. So it's the other species that survive around the rhino, the plants, the insects, everything. Waterways are affected. So it's quite a, you know, your, your pista species have quite a significant impact on the environment around them. And then obviously, approximately six years ago, um, when I had a, a close rhino encounter, not of the, you know, scary kind, um, I went on an actual de warning and there's just something so majestic and so iconic about these animals standing right next to that massive two-ton animal, hearing its breathing, feeling its skin, which is quite soft, even though it's about five centimeters thick in some places, being able to touch the rhino's horn before it was dehorned, and then being instrumental in having that animal translocated from one park to a different park because obviously to ensure biodiversity you sometimes have to do a physical exchange of your dominant bulls to prevent inbreeding and stuff like that so that to me was just a magical moment and i always say you'll never forget your first encounter with a rhino ever because they are our final and our last link to dinosaurs you know but yes when you talk about this uh I think most of our listeners won't understand what you just said in the context of dehorning because, you know, we, we've we seen things on TV that, you know, with rhinos with no horns and we think about horrible things, but this is not that. So help people understand what that means. Okay, so dehorning is a procedure that we do to actually prevent that rhino from being poached. So we remove the horn. It's done by a vet. So the vet darts, you know, obviously a wildlife vet, darts the animal. Um, there's a vet nurse that's on standby. They're administering uh, penicillin, vitamins, because whenever the animal's down, you do as much as possible because it's so tricky and so dangerous for them to put them under um, anesthetic. And then they literally take a chainsaw and they cut the horn off. And they file down the rough edges so that the animal doesn't damage itself or another animal. And that horn then gets kept, you know, it gets marked and labeled and DNA samples are taken. And that goes into a safe and it gets locked away. So each reserve is responsible for their own sort of stash of rhino horn. And it just sits there forever in a day. So and, the question that people need to understand is why are we taking this majestic animal who obviously has a horn for a reason, yeah. or, well, maybe not so obviously, but has a horn for a reason, and then you're compassionately removing the horn? It is literally to keep them alive. Because of the demand um, in your Asian countries, um, specifically China, Vietnam, um, there's a massive demand for rhino horn because very untruthfully, the rumor has been spread many years ago that it's a cure for cancer and etc. So these animals are... Like Yank and all kinds. Absolutely. All of this. All of this. And also... It's rhino horn is going to make you horny. No, it's not. And no, it's not. Uh, it's not. Uh, if, you, if you're not sure, go to the bathroom sink after you've had a... After, go to the shower after you've had a shower. You know that hair that's, that's around the sink that you normally pull out and flush? Well, just eat it and see if it makes you horn. Because it's made of the same thing as a rhino horn. Absolutely. Or just chew your own fingernails off yeah. and see if that works. See if that works. It's, it's all the same. Absolutely. So unfortunately, we have to resort to those extreme measures to keep these animals safe. Yeah. And the scary fact is that Unless we take drastic action, these animals will become extinct in the wild within five to six years. That's half a decade. Exactly. Absolutely. Yes. So I know yes. that there, there, there are white rhinos and then there are non-white rhinos. So to, <laughs> to what's the difference? Okay, so the two subspecies that we have in South Africa is the white rhino, and it's not white. 
and the black rhino is not black. They're okay. both gray yeah. uh, or a, a muddy color once they've had a, a mud wallow. But the white rhino has a wide um, sort of mouth mm -hmm. and very fleshy lips because they are grazers. So they mow the lawns. Okay. They're also much bigger than your um, black rhino. So they can go up to about 2.2 tons of unadulterated brutal animal. Well, they're actually very gentle giants unless you bug them. And then your black rhino is a browser. So it's got that little hook lip that it uses to, you know, break the branches off. And they also have more teeth than a white rhino because obviously with a white rhino, they just graze on grass where the incisors of the black rhino needs to actually cut through the branches. And they make a very neat 45 degree angle, by the way, when they cut through right. branches. So those are primarily the differences. So you, as I said, you've been running across these game reserves. And the first thing that comes up about that is, are you insane? Um, mm -hmm. Because if you're running through game reserves, you know, we see on TV that, you know, people go to game reserves and they're inside these vehicles that are all caged off and, you know, that we see that there's a lion on the freaking roof or whatever it is. And you're running through game reserves and I'm just thinking, oh, I guess this is a passing lunch. Oh, well, we've got takeaway coming for the lions. Fast food. <laughs> Talk to us about that. You know, this is also a question that I get quite often. Are you not afraid or scared running through these big five game reserves? Short, short answer is no. For the simple reason, animals do not drive cars. Okay. And an animal only knows how to animal. A rhino knows how to rhino. An elephant knows how to elephant. A lion knows how to lion, you know. So you know exactly what to expect from those animals. And if you respect and honor their space, they will leave you alone. And obviously, I am also, um, I don't kind of just rock up and go, okay, I'm going to run through a game reserve. So Please, the people that's listening to this podcast, don't do that. Okay. <laughs> but no, <laughs> it is prearranged, and it's because of what I do, the awareness that I bring to the poaching problem, and um, wanting to bring money into the country to, you know, obviously help with conservation of these animals. So it's all prearranged, and I at all times have an armed ranger and a standby vehicle with me. So should something go wrong, and touch wood, to date, nothing has happened. I've been quite safe. I've been quite happy. Um, the only animal I'm really wary of is a buffalo, you know, um, because they really do live up to their nickname of mean beef. So <laughs> very, very, especially your older bulls that have been pushed out of the herd. So they no longer have the protection of the herd. So their default is to attack. They don't ask questions. And you also never make eye contact with a buffalo. But I've run past beautiful lions. I've run past big elephant bulls, hundreds of giraffes, warthog, you name it, obviously rhinos. So it's been really such an incredible journey and experience, you know, and also to be able to be a voice for these animals. I, I can't imagine the, the, what, what it feels like to be in the presence of that majesty of animal. I hate zoos. Well, I will tell you that clearly. And I, I was in Indonesia and we went to a zoo and I honestly, I wanted to become a terrorist. Um, because it was so horrible to see a tiger or two tigers actually, um, inside this horrible cage. And they're such magnificent, huge. I mean, you, know, you see tigers on TV, so like the lions, you see them in a movie, or whatever. it's, you go, oh yeah, it's a big animal, but you can't possibly imagine until you're right there in front of it. And to see this animal in such a small space and so you know, when you think about uh, something like that compared to a rhino, you know, or an elephant, which is just monstrously large, I can't imagine what that's like 
in a sense of giving you perspective on how minuscule we are comparatively, and yet the huge amount of impact we have negatively on these creatures. How did you tie this idea of running with conservation? Because it, you know, it, it doesn't particularly correlate, obviously. Yes. So basically what my vision was, it was always to link, symbolically link all these reserves into a rhino conservation stronghold. So that is why I run from point A to the reserve, run through the reserve, go on to the next one. And then obviously there's the interaction with the rangers or the anti-poaching unit members with the management of the parks, your conservationists, the trained ones. Because disclaimer, I'm just a passionate conservationist. I'm not a trained conservationist. Yeah. So to have these conversations and to also have the conversations with ordinary South Africans and sometimes international guests whilst on foot. Because when you're on foot in nature, you are more vulnerable. As you say, you really get a very good idea of how tiny you actually are, you know, and how you can choose to play a positive role or to play a negative role. What is your choice? And I made that choice to get my legs and my voice to be the poster child, basically, for conservation and rhinos in particular. Because if we can save the rhinos, we can save everything. But if we can't save the rhinos, what's next? What can we save? So I always say to people, there's two things in life I do quite well. I run and I talk. You know, so I just made that decision to use the talents that is available to me and apply that to make it my purpose to save these animals or to play my little tiny minuscule part, my little gear, you know, I'm just one tiny little gear in a massive engine. So to really just do something to make people sit up, take note, and then ask the questions, but why? Why are you doing this? Tell us about it. And the minute that door opens, even if it's a millimeter, you know, you can barge right in it. You can have that conservation conversation and educate and inform and talk. You know, find out how do you feel about it? What do you know about it? Are you aware? Can I tell you, you know, but you need to do something epic because I believe, and there's a lot of people that feel the same way, that the world is suffering from rhino poaching fatigue and they are suffering from donor fatigue. So there's so many causes out there. Unless you stand out from the crowd because let's face it, there are millions of nonprofit organizations out there. And a lot of them... Standing with their hand out for a very reason, for a very, not just reasonable, but very good cause. And it becomes a filter of, yeah, the, all these causes matter and I'd like to help, but how do I help? You know, it's, it's too much. And so a lot, I think a lot, Absolutely. you know, we know that from a psychological position that if there are too many choices, people won't choose. And so it just seems like, oh my goodness, there's so many things I want to give to, I just can't choose one. So I'll, I'll walk away. And Absolutely. so what you're doing, talk to us just, you know, as we get towards the end of the first part of the show here, I want to, want to know about the impact corporately. How do you bring that message across to corporate organizations? I mean, you've worked for Ford and some of the big companies and you do that kind of work. So how... How do you get that message across so that large corporations are wanting to be involved for more than the prestige of, oh, we're saving the rhinos, and you don't really give a shit, because oftentimes that's the case. I'm not saying it's true with the ones you work with, but often is the case as in, you know, it's a rubber stamp rather than a change. So how how is that working for you, and how are you getting that across? So obviously it starts again with a conversation. You know, and and it's basically building relationships. So I don't like to do the whole hit and run thing. I have an aversion to hit and run. I like to build up relationships over a time, 
And I also like to over deliver um, prior to asking for something. So everybody wants their product out there. Everybody wants their company name out there. And I've had a lot of success with, with corporates and small and medium enterprises to say, okay, we will back you. And that's another thing that I've learned. People often back people. They back you because they know you, they like you, and they trust you. Again, it's the same with business. We do business with people we know, like, and trust. So li literally, I will say this 20 times over. It's all about building relationships. Because the minute you have a person's attention, you've got a personal relationship, you can have that conversation. Then it becomes about more than just company A or company B wanting to get their product out there, wanting to get their name up in lights. Then it becomes more personal. And, you know, there's a lovely saying that we have to move from caring to doing. So we all care. We all know there's something out there called runner budging. We all know about it. The world knows about it. It's a buzzword and it has been for more than a decade. But what are we doing? And it's really building those relationships and thinking long term because nothing in conservation is short term. And short term for us is probably somewhere in the region of about two to five years. That's a short term goal. Okay. So we're talking normally a decade or three when we talk conservation. So it's really walking that path, getting yourself entrenched, and also looking at aligning your values with a company, the corporate that you are working with. So that to me is a very important thing. I'm not going to go to a company that I know only works with gender-based violence and try and sell them a conservation concept. It's not going to work. So obviously, there's a lot of research. There's a lot of initial conversations. Um, giving value before asking for money. All of those things. It is a big, massive process. Yeah, it sounds like it is indeed. We are already at the end of part one of the show, and I want to make sure that people know more about how they can get in touch with you, find out more about what it is you're doing and all the resources that you have. Please tell people where they can find out more about you before we come back into part two of the show. Awesome. So easiest, obviously, is my social media. Um, on Instagram, Run Wild with Sharon. On Facebook, my personal page, which is Sharon Tate Jessup, T-A-I-T. -T. And then also the Run, Ride and Row Wild for Rhinos Facebook group. So a lot of the initiatives and stories are told on there. And then obviously my website as well, very plain and simple, SharonJessup.com, and then I stumble over my own name. <laughs> so SharonJessup.com. Okay, we will make sure, of course, that all those are posted in the show notes so you'll be able to find those. And we're going to be back in just one click with more of our delicious conversation with Sharon Jessup, a endurance athlete, conservationist, and a rebel with a cause indeed we're going to be back in just one click till then stay curious my friends stay curious we'll see you in the next half of this show <laughs>